Hi everyone, welcome to the Biosecurity Risk Assessment Training Webinar. Uh, my name is Dr. Stephen Roach and we have here with Dr. Dan Schock as well. Uh, it's March 2018 and we're going to be walking through exactly what is biosecurity and how, we, how do we want to conduct the biosecurity risk assessment on farm. A little bit more about me, uh, again my name is Dr. Stephen Roach. I work for Acer Consulting which is a research consulting company I've set up and we're working with the Dairy Farmers of Canada to develop a number of resources to educate veterinarians, dairy producers and other end users in the Canadian dairy industry on ProAction and how this program really is going to be rolled out and delivered. So, Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Dan Schock. I'm a bovine vet and I'm also an epidemiologist and consultant at Acer Consulting. So some training goals and objectives uh, for the webinar today. First, we really wanna just review what is ProAction and where does biosecurity as a module fit within the program uh, nationally. Uh, second, we'll discuss the roles, responsibilities, and expectations of you as a veterinarian, as well as some of the other members uh, in the uh, industry that play a key role and have really a, an important responsibility with respect to the uh, implementation uh, and compliance of ProAction. Third, we'll explain the intent of the biosecurity risk assessment and how it's uh, developed. And then we would give you a bit of instruction and guidelines on the on-farm implementation of the risk assessment uh, for your clients. So just to start high level, uh, what is ProAction? Well, ProAction is a national quality and customer assurance program for Canada, or for the Canadian dairy industry. It's led and developed by the Dairy Farmers of Canada in collaboration with a number of representatives from producers to veterinarians to other key researchers and industry players across the, uh, the country. And it's supported and ultimately administered by the provinces ac right across the country. And the, the slogan or one of the important things to remember here is this is a program that's intended to be by farmers for farmers. So farmers had an input on the content and the uh, development of the, pro uh, the program all along the way. And I think that's important to mention. Nationally, ProAction is comprised of six core modules. The first is milk quality, followed by food safety, and then four new modules to the industry, the first of which is animal care, livestock traceability, biosecurity, and environment. And of course, for this webinar, our focus is going to be on biosecurity specifically. So next we'll take a look at what actually are we talking about when we're referring to biosecurity. So as we all know, it's a series of practices that are designed to really prevent, reduce, or eliminate both the introduction and the spread of disease among populations of animals. So again, disease costs us in terms of time and money. So we all know an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure, and that follows with disease. Uh, good, good biosecurity ensures healthy and productive herds. So why do we really want to be promoting biosecurity? Why is this part of the ProAction initiative? So really promoting optimal herd health will result in lower drug use. And we all know that with the changing climate uh, surrounding antimicrobial resistance and antimicrobial use, this is a really important thing to consider. Next is having a robust biosecurity program allows us as a country and an industry to deal with uh, the global threat and emergence of, and reemergence of bovine infectious diseases. So things like foot and mouth, uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, things that arm us to be uh, resilient in, in the face of these diseases. So timelines, we all know that milk quality and food safety modules of ProAction are already implemented, as is the animal care and livestock traceability in September 2017. So really we're focusing on the biosecurity module that will be implemented in September 2019. So by September 2019, producers are expected to be compliant with the requirements of the biosecurity module that we'll go through now. Yeah, and so just to build on what Dan's talking about related to the implementation and scoring of producers when it comes to the biosecurity section of ProAction, um, at a high level for ProAction when it comes to compliance, the, uh, the ProAction modules have been rolled out in a stepwise manner, and Dan has, uh, has alluded to those already. The really and the most important thing to mention here is that all farmers must be compliant on, on these dates, dates above. So for biosecurity, again, that's September of 2019. And producers must be compliant with these dates regardless of their validation date. So if they're going to have a validator coming on farm on September 1st of 2019, they must 
be in compliance with what's expected under biosecurity and all the way through to uh, uh, in perpetuity uh, as the pro action rolls along in the industry. So a little bit more on that validation piece. Uh, each province is going to have validators attending uh, or, or visiting each farm to assess compliance with the requirements as they've been laid out by ProAction. And the validation is going to follow the existing schedule that's been set up in a number of these provinces. And really what that means is that at least one on-farm visit will happen every two years for each producer. Now, some provinces or in, in uh, national level, this validation schedule generally follows a on-farm visit in one year, followed by a self-declaration year the following year, which would be a, the producer providing a, a written document saying that they are indeed in compliance and have continued to follow the or meet the requirements of ProAction. In some provinces, when it comes to some of these modules, they may actually uh, have more frequent on-farm validation schedule. And so it's recommended that you speak with your provincial coordinator, depending on which province you are and to find out the specific details of the validation schedule in your province. So again, just to reiterate, the first on-farm validation date on or after September 2019, farmers are going to be evaluated for the following things. Food safety, animal care, livestock traceability, and of course, now biosecurity. So when it comes to scoring producers uh, on these requirements, it's going to be similar to the food safety system that's already been set up and implemented in Canada, with the requirements graded as compliant or non-compliant. When it comes to non-compliance, there really are two major categories that we want to look for. The first of which is a mandatory requirement that would be graded if non-compliant as a major or a minor. These are for mandatory requirements and the grade depends on the severity or the extent of non-compliance as judged by the validator when he or she is attending uh, or conducting the on-farm validation. The other form of non-compliance uh, when it comes to scoring is demerits and this would be given when not in compliance with a non-mandatory element of the program and these demerits would range from one to five with a higher number of demerits indicating more severe non-compliance for that producer or that specific requirement. So just a little bit now on the ProAction roles and responsibilities, because I think it's important to clarify this and make them explicit for you as veterinarian. The Dairy Farmers of Canada, their job here is to administer ProAction nationally. Farmers, their job are threefold, to understand and comply with requirements as they are set out in ProAction. Second, to complete the biosecurity risk assessment once every two years in conjunction with you, their herd veterinarian. And third, to take accountability and ultimately demonstrate continuous improvement as it's defined by the program. As veterinarians, you have a few jobs with respect to your roles and responsibilities. And first is to be knowledgeable about the program and provide, you with on, uh, provide your clients with on-farm guidance as part of your professional services. Second is to conduct the on-farm biosecurity risk assessments with your clients. And third is to really collaborate with them on the reduction, elimination, and or management of biosecurity risks. Lastly, the role and responsibility of on-farm validators is first, they are formally trained and regularly evaluated by the Dairy Farmers of Canada for consistency when it comes to scoring. Second is to conduct the on-farm assessment for farm, or of farmer compliance with the ProAction requirements. And lastly, I just want to sort of comment on why veterinarians? Why are we working with veterinarians across the country? And why are you such an important uh, cog in this wheel? First, uh, when it comes to biosecurity, of course, it's no surprise. Veterinarians are on-farm experts in animal health and disease transmission. You have the content knowledge and the expertise to speak to these issues in a, in a meaningful way. And you have the context. You understand the specific environment that this uh, discussion needs to take place in and really uh, tailor your recommendations, tailor, tailor that discussion for each producer in each unique situation. I also really like the role of the veterinarian in this process because it, it contributes to the evolving role of food animal veterinarians and that's not just about arming cows or dealing with emergencies as they arise but rather being a consultative voice on the farm. It also allows you to keep up with industry changes because certainly ProAction is going to have a monumental change and impact on the Canadian dairy industry. And I think it's a great opportunity for you as, uh, as a veterinarian to strengthen your relationships with your clients. Again, this is all about helping them, coaching, mentoring them through this process. And I think that's a really great position for Canadian veterinarians to be in. All right, for the next section of this webinar, I'm going to be taking everyone through the specific biosecurity requirements of this module. So starting off, 
every producer needs to have completed a biosecurity risk assessment with their veterinarian in order to identify and address biosecurity risks on the farm. And again, a reminder here, this is a major minor requirement here. So it must be completed biennially with a veterinarian. Another important thing to note is that validators are not evaluating the score of the risk assessment. They are validating whether it's been conducted and whether it's signed and dated and there's one recommendation to improve uh, on-farm biosecurity. The second biosecurity requirement, producers are required to record disease events. And this is a demerit-based uh, requirement. So when we're looking at cow diseases, there's really six uh, that need to be recorded on farm. So these required are abortions, lameness events, mastitis events, diarrhea, pneumonia, and death. And with calves, there's really three conditions that need to be rec recorded, diarrhea, pneumonia, and death. So at minimum, these records must contain the disease event, the, the identification of the animal, and the date of the disease occurrence. And so what validators are doing, they're going through records um, to assess completeness of the records. And they, for non-compliant individuals, they would assess a demerit uh, based score of one through five, depending on the level of uh, records completion. So really, as experts in animal health, I think veterinarians are well positioned uh, to promote disease recording. And really, if we're going to motivate producers to record disease, I think we've got to do something with that data. So create action plans uh, in order to promote improved animal health. I think this is an excellent opportunity to bring added value to your clients, because we all know if we're not measuring disease, you really can't manage it. You don't have that level of control over it, and ultimately you can't improve. So that's the ultimate goal of production, is to improve animal health on uh, dairy operations. As a little bit of a disclaimer, we're, the disease definitions that we'll go through today are not specific case of definitions outlined in ProAction. They're really industry or vet recommended definitions that serve as a guideline when you're working with your producers uh, in order to decide what diseases they should be recording. So we really want to make sure everyone's on the same page. So to go through the specific diseases, uh, commonly uh, commonly held a definition of abortion is really the expulsion of the fetus between 42 days and 260 days of gestation. When we're looking at mastitis, we really want to make sure producers are attuned to the clinical signs that we're looking for with mastitis infections. So changes in the milk, so color, consistency, clots, presence. There may or may not be changes in the quarter, so the cardinal signs of inflammation, redness, heat, pain, swelling could be, could be present as well. And also systematic, system, systemic signs of disease, so fever, inappetence, lethargy, dehydration. The next case definition that we'll go over is lameness. And really we're basing this on these definitions on the animal care assessments uh, that the producers are currently being uh, assessed with. So two different ways of looking at things depending on the, the housing type, so tie stalls. We're going to define lameness as any of these two, two of these four behaviors. So repeated weight shifting, uneven weight uh, bearing, standing on the edge of the stall, and uneven movement. In a free stall, it could be a, there could be a presence or absence of a limp. There might also be the presence of seven indicators of lameness, such as reluctance to bear weight, asymmetric stepping, poor tracking, jerky head movements, joint stiffness, rear leg lateral movement, and arch back. So really. Uh, trying to look at the signs that cows are showing us and classifying them as lame. The next disease definition, so diarrhea, and this could apply for mature cattle and calves as well. Uh, diarrhea, really a lowering of the viscosity of the manure, so it's becoming more watery. It's often uh, at an increased volume and frequency of defecation. And there may or may not be blood or fibrin present in the manure, plus or minus dehydration as well in the in that cow or calf. When we're classifying pneumonia, uh, we're looking for signs. We're trying to teach the producer to look for signs of uh, increased respiratory rate, uh, dyspnea or increased effort in breathing, nasal discharge is that present, harsh lung sounds. There may or may not be a fever. So really. 
this section is about starting the conversation and making sure everyone's on the same page when we're recording disease events on farm. Okay, so the third uh, biosecurity re requirement reads, have you established and implemented a standard operating procedure in consultation with your veterinarian for vaccinating against speci specific diseases of concern? This is a major minor requirement and has one required element. That requirement um, is uh, ultimately to document the products, the group of animals, and any other information that's required for the vaccination program. And it's important that to, to note that it's recommended that farmers consult with their veterinarian to establish a vaccination program based on their specific herd's cattle health management plan. So you can see in the wording of this requirement and several others that will move forward, there's really a promotion of the of farmers working with their veterinarian to establish proper procedures when it comes to biosecurity and the management of the health of their animals. One specific note I want to mention here uh, related to this requirement is that ProAction is not requiring that farmers uh, actually vaccinate their animals. All farmers must absolutely have an SOP, but farmers are not required to vaccinate their herd, and they simply must have an SOP indicating they do not vaccinate if that's what they choose to do. Validators are going to review that vaccination SOP and expect to see vaccine information or indication that vaccination is not performed on the farm. Now, the fourth requirement here uh, is a little bit of a long one. It says, have you established and implemented an SOP in consultation with your veterinarian to, provide the or to prevent the introduction of infectious diseases when bringing new cattle specifically into your facilities from other herds? This is a major minor requirement and has six required elements of, uh, to the SOP. Now, this is, again is a mandatory element and validators are going to assess the presence of each of the six required elements that are present within the SOPs. Two things I'd like to mention here. One is that the, uh, there will likely be a, a wizard or a tool that's available for farmers to uh, develop their SOPs. And there are minimum six required elements, but there are many more things that we would like to often to see in these SOPs. And that's where your opportunity and, and role is to play a role is to say what's most appropriate on this given farm. Now, the six minimum required elements that must be uh, included in this uh, SOP are as follows. The first of which is to uh, indicate that the farmer requests information on all cattle prior to the purchase and movement. And that information will be related to vaccinations, any treatments, any foot trimming protocols uh, and dates, followed by a designation, uh, designating an area, area for incoming cattle that's appropriate for the herd situation. Third, to observe and examine new additions frequently, and by frequently they mean at least daily. Fourth is to identify and train staff who will monitor the cattle according to the monitoring protocol established for the farm. Five is to respond to any abnormalities identified during this period. And six, to perform the actions that must be taken for new cattle prior to introduction into the home herd. And that might be confirmation of pregnancy or reproductive status, hoof trimming, vaccination, testing, and any other pertinent details, again, relating to the, those action plans that have set, been set up by you. Now, this next biose biosecurity requirement, number five, reads somewhat similar to the uh, past one. Have you established and implemented an SOP in consultation with your veterinarian to prevent the introduction of infectious diseases by cattle returning to your facilities from other herds or cattle shows or other uh, places off of the farm? This is a major minor requirement and has five required elements. Now I'll just stop here for a moment and, and, and uh, explain that there may be important differences in the way producers handle cattle returning to the farm versus cattle that are purchased and brought into the farm as new introductions. And uh, the discussion at the national level among producers as well as veterinarians and other members uh, of the development committee were, were that it's important to distinguish the differences between these two protocols. And as a result, that's why you see similar but different requirements related to the um, introduction of new cattle into the farm versus cattle returning. And so here we have, we're talking about cattle returning to the farm. Validators are going to assess the presence of each of the following five required elements in the uh, SOP. Those required elements are to designate an area that's appropriate for the herd situation for incoming and returning cattle, to observe and examine new additions frequently, again, that's at least daily. Third is to identify and train staff who will monitor the cattle according to mon the monitoring protocol established for the farm. Four is to respond to any abnormalities. And five, again, similar to the last one, is to perform the actions that must be taken for new cattle prior to introduction to the home herd. Again, that might be confirmation of pregnancy, hoof trimming, vaccination, and so on. 
All right, the next biosecurity requirement, requirement number six, really focuses on people coming onto and off of the farm. So be they family, employees, farm visitors, and service providers, we really need to realize that they could be vectors of disease transmission on farm. So we have to have uh, protocols in place, standard operating procedures in place to deal with the risk, mitigate the risk. Again, this is a major minor requirement. It's a mandatory element and the validators are really going to look at assessing four elements that must be present in the standard operating procedure. So what are these requirements? First, there needs to be a list of biosecurity measures for visitors and service personnel to follow depending on the level of risk that each visitor could pose. So for instance, veterinarians being that we're in contact with diseased animals on a daily basis would be of the higher uh, level of risk versus uh, uh, family members that might not be in contact with that many diseased animals are a little bit lower risk because they're also from this farm usually. Second requirement, all visitors and service personnel need to put on overshoes, clean, that means wash and disinfected boots, or disposable boots, bo disposable boots prior to entering the production area. If that's the case, there needs to be a designated area for disposal of coveralls and boots and gloves that become soiled through their visit on the farm. The producers also need to provide and maintain washing stations, and that means for hands and boots that can be used prior to entering the production unit. Moving along to biosecurity requirement number seven. Producers are required to have visible signage posted at every main access point or the main access point which is visible from the main parking area and this is a major minor requirement of the biosecurity module. So to recap uh, there are seven requirements of the ProAction biosecurity mon module. Requirement one requires the biennial completion of a biosecurity risk assessment on farm. Requirement two uh, necessitates producers record specific disease events on their farm. Requirement three is the vaccination standard operating procedure. Requirement four uh, outlines or uh, guidelines uh, on introducing new cattle and requires an SOP. Requirement five uh, requires an SOP dealing with returning cattle, so uh, cattle from the farm returning to the home farm. Requirement six deals with family farm uh, employees and visitors, SOPs, uh, biosecurity SOPs, and requirement seven requires a visible signage presence uh, before entry to the production unit. So for this next section, Steve and I are going to take you through how to conduct the biosecurity farm risk assessment. So what is this risk assessment? It's based on national standards for biosecurity on dairy farms. And this was developed in conjunction with uh, the CFIA, so the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, and the Dairy Farmers of Canada in 2012 to highlight key risk areas on Canadian dairy farms. It provides the framework um, for which, or by, uh, upon which, Biosecurity's ProAction module was based. We'll take you through the four key areas of the bio, uh, Biosecurity Risk Assessment uh, uh, tool. The first being animal health management, the second looking at animal additions and movement, the third being premises and sanitation management, and the fourth, personnel, vehicles, and equipment. So we're assessing risk in all these key four areas of the dairy farm. So some things to keep in mind when conducting the biosecurity risk assessment. These must be completed biennially and, biennially and signed and dated by the veterinarian. There needs to be a minimum of one recommendation for management change to improve biosecurity. And we recommend that these are realistic and feasible changes that can be implemented by producers. The real goal of this risk assessment is to provide focused vet farmer discussions about how to reduce, eliminate, or manage identified risks throughout the farm. Some additional comments on conducting the biosecurity risk assessment. These are designed to be conducted on farm, specifically with the area of interest that we're assessing in the risk assessment. The suggested order is based on disease risk and susceptibility. So we, uh, we recommend starting with young calves, moving into the milking herd, and then finally sick animals. We really want farmers to give an honest estimate for the frequency of each practice. So does it 
Does this farmer always or off, always pre, uh, practice this practice? So greater than 95% of the time? Almost always, so 70 to 95% of the time. Sometimes, so that can be in the range of 1 to 69% of the time. Or never, not at all, 0% of the time. The first section of the risk assessment deals with cattle health management. And really these first three questions are focusing on contact of susceptible animals with other animals. Specifically, do pre-weaned calves have contact with older cattle? Um, do weaned calves have contact with lactating animals? Do dry cows have contact with lactating animals? So this is all surrounding uh, finding risk or identifying risks of susceptible animals having contact with animals that could transmit disease to them. The next set of three questions really focuses on the first day of life for that calf. So how is the producer managing that calf during the first day? Does the producer prevent calves from nursing their dam? We all know that's a risk factor for transmitting a lot of the diarrheal pathogens, including yonis, uh, rota, corona, crypto. Are the dam and the calf separated within 30, year, 30 minutes after birth? And is the newborn calf offered at least four liters of colostrum, or if you're a Jersey farmer, two liters of colostrum, within the first 12 hours of birth? And the first feeding is really recommended to be no longer than six hours after birth. The next three set of questions is really focused on disease risk when feeding pre-weaned dairy calves. Does that producer practice the feeding of non-saleable milk? So abnormal milk or milk with drug residues to calves. This could be a risk for disease transmission, so mastitis pathogens, uh, drug residues could be present in this milk. Does that producer pasteurize non-saleable milk before it is fed? This is a method of reducing disease transmission risk by re uh, reducing the pathogen load within that milk. Also, keeping in mind disease prevention priorities of the farm, are calves housed in a way that minimizes disease risk? So things like ventilation, bedding, hygiene, stocking density, etc. Does the producer practice uh, um, excellent uh, management strategies to prevent disease transmission in these uh, pre-weaned calves, calf housing? Moving along, these next two questions really focus on cow immunity and we'll bring it back to the standard operating procedure for vaccination. So does this producer follow a veterinarian reviewed vaccination program for specific diseases? And this is a yes or no question. And if yes, which diseases does that producer vaccinate? The next two questions are focused on disease recording. Um, and disease standard operating procedures or treatment protocols or ways of dealing with animals that do contract disease on the farm. Does that producer have a written standard operating procedure for dealing with clinical cases of infectious disease on their farm? And for which diseases are there standard operating procedures on the farm? So continuing on with cattle health management, uh, this next question, are sick or infected cattle managed after those that are healthy? And as we know, this is really about managing risk and susceptibility on the farm with respect to the classes of animals as we go through the barn. Next, do you maintain health records? Include the disease event record for individual animals. And really this gets to that requirement in, uh, as part of one of the major requirements of, uh, of ProAction to uh, record disease events uh, for at minimum a handful of diseases. And this is an opportunity to convey the importance of doing that and even uh, capturing information on uh, additional disease events or conditions that arise. And following from that question, the next one, do you review health records to monitor the occurrence of infectious diseases in your herd, is a really great opportunity, which Dan spoke about earlier. The value of recording something is only as good as whether or not you use that information. So here's a great opportunity, uh, opportunity to identify any in trends, any uh, benchmarking that might be uh, prudent or, or worthwhile to make use of that data. Next, does your veterinarian perform necropsies on cattle that die of unknown causes? And of course, we know this is an excellent opportunity to identify uh, emerging issues that might be uh, cropping up in the farm uh, and a great opportunity to identify something as early as possible uh, to get a handle of it, especially if it's related to an infectious disease. 
Next, we go outside of the barn. Is manure spread on fields which will be grazed or harvested for young cattle during the same season? And this is a, a, a good risk factor for something for like uh, Yoni's disease, where we know MAP bacteria can survive uh, more than 12 months in sunlight on, gra on uh, grazing or um, fields that have been uh, spread with uh, infectious manure. Now, uh, the last one, uh, do you follow a veterinarian reviewed parasite control program? And again, uh, we all understand the importance of, uh, of, of providing and following a parasitic control program. The important thing to notice here is that the scale has changed and really it's a yes, no question. It's dichotomized for the producer. So what have you recommended and are they following a specific program based on those recommendations? Now moving into section two, uh, we're talking about cattle additions and movement. And again, this maps quite well to some of the requirements that, the mandatory requirements that producers must follow as part of the biosecurity module. First, have you introduced new cattle into your herd since this risk assessment was last performed or in the last two years if no prior uh, risk assessment was performed? Simply a yes or no question and we know that the introduction of new cattle uh, in an open herd is a significant risk factor for the introduction of a new uh, disease. If the answer is yes to the previous statement, then four questions have to be gone through. The first of which is, do you insist on receiving health records before introducing cattle into your herd? Following by insisting that these cattle are vaccinated, that they are isolated, and that they are tested for specific diseases of concern. So really this is getting into more detail to identify risk areas with respect to those animals that are coming in and to ensure that nothing is going to impact the, the herd of origin. And uh, it's a great opportunity to map back again onto those requirements and the SOP that needs to be developed as part of the biosecurity module. Now we have a dichotomous question and uh, in the time since the last risk assessment or in the last two years, have cattle been reintroduced after being in contact with other cattle such as shows, fairs, boarding or other examples? And if yes, do you isolate these animals before introducing them into your herd? And so again, similar to the requirement on uh, having an SOP for uh, returning animals to the herd, it's about identifying and explicitly um, writing out how you'll deal with uh, and manage areas of risk. Next, do you isolate sick cattle from their herd mates? Plain and simple, we know that this is an important route of transmission and we want to identify if this is being done as efficiently as possible to maintain the health, of, uh, uh, the health status of healthy animals. So section three of the on-farm risk assessment really goes through and assesses uh, premises and sanitation management. So risk factors that could be associated with sanitation uh, of the premises. These first two questions are really looking at environmental hygiene. So these are all practices associated and inf that influence udder and leg hygiene. So things like our alleyways scraped, flushed, frequently enough to prevent manure accumulation of, on the cow's feet and, feet and legs. And our cow's stalls clean frequently enough to prevent manure contamination of their udders. The next two questions really focus on housing of sick animals. Uh, and this is really all about breaking the cycle of disease transmission. So after a sick animal has been housed in a pen, uh, does that producer disinfect pens uh, be between uses of each animal? Do they have e even have a, de a designated area for sick animals? Because as Steve alluded to before, these are the animals most likely to be shedding pathogens to susceptible individuals. So we really want to make sure they're isolated on a farm. The second, this next two set of questions is really focusing on the calving pen management. So as we all know, transition cows are at an increased risk of uh, contracting uh, infectious diseases because they're in an immunocompromised state. So does that producer clean and sanitize the calving pen after each use? And in the event that they don't clean and sanitize the pen, do they remove soiled and wet bedding uh, and add new bedding between uses? So as we all know, we're trying to really break the cycle of disease transmission between animals. And this is what it's really all about, preventing pathogen buildup and breaking that cycle. The next section really looks at cows as an outcome. So how good a job is this producer doing at maintaining or improving the hygiene of their calving area? So when you're looking at udders, flanks, uh, lower legs, are they free of manure in cows that are in the calving area? So that's telling us a lot about how the dry cows are being housed. Is the producer successfully managing house in a way that minimizes manure accumulation? So we know that manure accumulation on the udder can be a risk factor for not only for mastitis, 
but also disease transmission for that calf should she um, suckle before being, uh, before being isolated. The next question focuses on fomites. So does the producer clean on-farm animal health equipment? So things like balling guns, dehorners, hoof knives, stomach tubes, etc. after each use. So we all know that these implements are more likely to be used in sick animals. So it's even more important that we ensure that they're adequately sanitized between each use. Again, to try and break that cycle of disease transmission between infected and susceptible animals. The next question really focuses on whether the same equipment is being used to clean the environment that's being used to feed animals because as we all know there's a lot of diseases in adult and uh, immature cattle that uh, are of the fecal oral transmission route so if a producer is using the same implements to do both functions that's a big risk factor for disease transmission on the farm the next question looks at using common rectal sleeves when uh, breeding animals so as we all know, uh, using common rectal sleeves between cattle has been suggested as a risk factor for bovine leukosis virus disease transmission. And so if really for this question, it's important that vets lead by example and that we're not uh, practicing this, this practice as well. The next question looks at uh, when, when producers are vaccinating, treating, or taking blood samples from an animal, is a new needle use for each animal. So this is really important specifically at decreasing the transmission of bloodborne infections such as bovine leukosis virus. And also sharp needles minis minimize stress on the animal and reduce the chances that there will be broken needles within that animal. The next question looks at the management of dead animals on the farm. So these are potential sources of infection. So these animals could have died of an infectious disease. So we really want to promote producers to store these animals in such a way that they're inaccessible to animals that could act as vectors for disease. So uh, cats, birds, rodents, their having access to these dead animals could be a risk factor for transmitting infectious disease on the farm. So we want to really isolate these dead animals. The next section looks at whether or not the farmer pre uh, prevents uh, animals from having fence line contact. We know that different farms have different disease challenges, different strains of pathogens. So uh, we know that having fence line contact could actually facilitate nose to nose contact, transmission of aerosolized uh, pathogens, and also uh, common fomites uh, might act as disease vectors for transmission. So we really wanna minimize contact with animals from other farms. This next question looks at how feed is stored. So again, this is all protecting uh, feed from contamination uh, by other cattle, dogs, cats or birds and rodents that could act as vectors for disease transmission. So again, really trying to break down the cycle of disease transmission and isolate uh, feed that could act as a carrier for disease. So the last section in the biosecurity risk assessment is section four, and that relates to personnel, visitors, vehicles, and equipment. The first question, do you require all workers, visitors, and farm service personnel to wear clean or disposable coveralls and boots on your farm? Again, a very great opportunity for veterinarians to lead by example in washing and, and bringing new, um, uh, essentially, equipment and uh, coveralls um, to the farm uh, and ensuring that other members of the farm are doing the same thing to break that uh, cycle of disease transmission and prevent pathogen transmission. Next, do you have visible signage on the farm informing all visitors about where to report, who to contact, and restricted areas upon approval? This is a yes-no question and should be an easy one given that this is a, a specific requirement within the biosecurity module, except this, this uh, uh, question asks for a little bit more detail on the signage where the, as the requirement's a little bit more general. So a good opportunity to identify the importance and the value of having a very specific sign that says this is why this is important and where should these individuals report. Next, do you have an SOP for international visitors addressing footwear and clothing? And of course, this is recognizing the unique risk that international visitors may pose uh, when visiting a farm, given that they're coming from other jurisdictions and borders that may have other novel disease challenges or may be able to present novel disease challenges to our farms. 
Next, do you maintain a visitor log? Again, similar to the sign, it's a great opportunity to promote very effective biosecurity and collect information so uh, such that an, an issue does occur, there's an opportunity to go back and trace back who, where that uh, issue might have ar arisen and who else might be at risk. Now that completes the specific questions within the biosecurity risk assessment and that would lead you to have the following conversation with your client which would be to provide some recommendations for improving the biosecurity situation on the farm and ultimately reducing risk. And so our recommendations to you are to review the scores for each section with your client and identify the areas of highest risk. Highlight and discuss the areas of concern that you might have and then provide at least one priority best management practices or recommendation to improve biosecurity on the farm. Your recommendations should ultimately try to be smart and by that we mean specific, measurable, attainable, relevant and time-based. These need to be explicit and identified and the most important part about this risk assessment is not so much the scores, the individual scores, but having the conversation with the producer conveying the importance of doing these things given the all of the other priorities that your clients will have when it comes to managing the farm. Ultimately, our goal is to reduce infectious disease entry and spread on the farm, plain and simple. So with that, Dan and I would like to thank you and point you on to visit dairyfarmers.ca forward slash proaction to identify and, and uh, pick up any other useful resources that are being developed uh, and will continue to be developed by the Dairy Farmers of Canada and their other partners. And also to contact your provincial coordinators for specific questions about how proaction in the biosecurity module is being rolled out in your province. And please feel free to contact us at uh, for following emails for any questions. If we can't answer them, we will certainly find someone who can. Thanks very much for watching and good luck.